a bone stuff. So osteo is a big one. The lower back pain is a bigger big one. So we've got some more slides dedicated to those. We'll talk about uh, Paget's disease and bone cancer and a few other things. And then the last part of the lecture, last half of the lecture will be on collagen issues, which kind of overlaps with bone, but is really a destruction of collagen or a destruction of bone. Okay. So musculoskeletal. All right. So here's our disorders here for um, bone stuff. So osteoporosis. So we have a bone that is healthy versus a bone that is porous or osteoporous, osteoporosis, right? So it is a porous bone that has been uh, degraded over time. These are our best bones. Health is around age 30, 35, right? And then, so over here, you can see we've degraded our bone over time. It can be just due to age or it can be due to disorders, diseases, a IV push medication you give every day called what? Also, it's popular in Lake LA, methylprednisolone, right? So methylprednisolone is a uh, corticosteroid that will degrade your bones, right? It breaks down the matrix of bone, right? The matrix is made of what? What is the, ma what is the, what is the main structure of bone? Collagen, right? So collagen is the main structure, and that is what gets lysed with steroids, right? And then we'll talk about Paget's disease, right? It's uh, actually pretty common, but not, not very symptomatic until it is symptomatic and causes disfigured, disfiguring uh, situations like a disfigured leg or face. And then we'll talk about scoliosis, which only gets diagnosed by school nurses in school, right? You never hear about it ever, ever again. And then uh, we got to talk about lower back pain, which is like the most common, one of the most common complaints besides fatigue to, uh, to, a, to a provider, okay? And then bone cancer, which is exceedingly rare. It's like very, very rare, but a lot of, a lot of, metas a lot of uh, other cancers metastasize to bones, right? They spread to the bone and we get disorders that we have to recognize are complications of uh, metastasis, right? So here's scoliosis. Scoliosis has an S shape to it. It's the only one that has a lateral change, right? Every other bone, every other spine disorder usually has a the spine going forward in flexion or hyperextending, right? That's lordosis and kypho or kyphosis is going forward, lordosis is going back, all right? So here is a uh, can be complication of osteoporosis and also bone cancer. We got a compression fracture there. So over time, the bone gets weak and more weak and more weak, and you get a fracture of the bone. And when we talk about these other dis these disorders, all right, you have fragility fractures, regular fractures, and you have pathological fractures. Pathological fractures would be something that is like due to a cancer or a weakening bone of some sort. Fragility fractures usually is with, we associate with uh, osteoporosis, but it's pretty much the same thing. Your bones are weak and they fractured, okay? Versus a regular fracture, or if you just get in a, a accident or you get into a collision, that is going to cause a regular fracture, right? Here's an example of uh, bone uh, cancer, and then down here is metastasis. That's actually from testicular cancer. It's metastasized to the bones. All right, so osteoporosis. All right, so this is a big one. It's very common, right? Over here in, the, in blue is our primary osteoporosis, means that it just develops with age, right? It wasn't corticosteroids. It wasn't smoking. It wasn't alcohol. It wasn't anticonvulsant use. It was age, right? Most commonly affects women more than men because estrogen is actually protective. And you're like, well, don't, don't men have it too? Yet, or yes, men have a little bit of estrogen, but their, their bone mineral density goes down because of low testosterone. Testosterone plays a role as well. But primarily, it's women who develop uh, bone marrow, not bone marrow, bone uh, mineral density re reduction, a reduction in bone mass, I keep saying, I want to say menstrual, BMD, <laughs> right? Bone mineral density. All right, so we'll talk about, there's a test we can do, a diagnostic test we can do to assess someone's bone mineral density, right? And that tells you they're at risk for osteoporosis and of course at risk for fractures and we gotta start medications, right? So we got a deterioration in bone tissue, right? Why? Because we have, we're, we are osteoclasts are super active or our osteoblasts are not active enough. So on the next slide, we kind of go over what those are, what those uh, do exactly. So we got more breakdown compared to formation of bone. So osteoclasts cleave bone is the best mnemonic to come with. They cleave, they catastrophize, I don't know. They make, they make bone c c 
co away. I don't know. So they they are they are bone they are breaking down bone, right? That's what osteoclasts do. They cleave bone. Osteoclasts cleave, and then osteoblasts build bone. Sorry, they are good. You want osteoblasts. Osteoblasts build bone. I don't know how. To, okay, the mnemonic is a stretch, but it might it might work for you. Okay, so the osteoblasts build bone. You want those, right? Alcohol, for instance, inhibits those. Steroids inhibits osteoblasts. Therefore, that's bad, right? Osteoclasts are they good or bad? They cleave bone. They break apart bone, right? They demineralize bone, right? They make bone. Uh, get from a normal state to a abnormal state, right? So we don't want osteoclasts. And osteoclasts commonly are, are stimulated by infection, or in, sorry, inflammation more commonly, right? So you have, of course, inf infection of the bone, which is called what? Osteomyelitis, that will make your bone nice, weak, and spongy, and cause fractures. But uh, widespread inflammation, right? Someone who has uh, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis, or chronic kidney disease, or obesity, all of these are chronic inflammatory states, right? So chronic inflammation is one of the leading reasons for a uh, breakdown in your bone because we're stimulating osteoclasts. And it's by the stimulation of what's called rank L. So rank L is over here somewhere. Rank L is a inflammatory uh, marker that will then stimulate osteoclasts to increase in activity, right? So rank L, or right, I lost it. All right, so rank L right there. So rank L is stimulated by smoking. So rank L is stimulated by inflammation. So all these things are stimulating osteoclasts, right? Most common bone disease in humans, right? A lot of people have it. Very many people will get it, right? Those who are over age 50 are high risk, and they should probably be on some medication to uh, if they have a poor bone mineral density, okay? So, and then those who do get a fracture because they are older and they might have are osteopenic if they don't have a, a, a um, underlying problem like an orange here, right? So they have no orange issues, but they're just getting older. They have a, um, their gender is female, right, over male, or if they have um, a, a small frame. So a small frame, I had to like rack my brain, it's like why would a small frame person be at higher risk for a disease? Well, they have less bone than a regular bigger boned person. Not like big boned obesity, but a big bone, like they have more bones compared to a, a small frame person has less bone compared to a bigger bone person. So they can get osteoporotic faster, right? They have less, less bone to deal with, to start with, okay? So when they get a fracture, fractures are actually a really, really high mortality, right? One third of those will die in one year from that fracture, right? Compared to like an MI, right? Someone has a heart attack, they got like a three to 5% mortality, right? So it's almost like, you know, six to eight times a worse situation when you get a fracture when you're older, right? Because there's, if you, you might survive the fracture, but then you're bed bound, and you have all the complications of bed being bed bound, complications of being a sniff, complications of being in a hospital, all these things are leading to a lot of um, complications. And of course, this is a big expenditure. So if we could prevent this by preventing smoking, preventing alcohol, preventing obesity, then we're in better shape. But these are the other reasons why you might have a bone that is getting more porous over time. Technically, it's called osteopenia when your bone is just getting thinner because of age, because of gender or small frame. But osteomalacia, malacia sounds bad. Malacia is weakening of the bone due to some problem, some disorder, right? So corticosteroids, if you're on steroids for more than three months, it puts you at high risk of uh, bone breakdown, right? And bone fractures for that matter. So what do corticosteroids do? They decrease estrogen, they decrease vitamin D. And as we'll find out, vitamin D is pretty important to help our, uh, our bone health, or for our bone health, it provides the calcium, right? So we can have all the osteoblast activity in the world. And what do osteoblasts do? They build bone, but they need calcium and phosphate, right? To build that bone. They lay the calcium and phosphate like engineers or construction workers, they lay it down on the collagen matrix, right? Just like you have a frame of a building and you lay plywood, or I don't know how buildings are made actually, but you lay plywood, you lay what, you know, with the insulation maybe? I don't know, you lay all that stuff on a building and that's going to build the building, right? So you might, so corticosteroids are breaking down the collagen, which is the structure of the building, and they're actually inhibiting the osteoblast as well, inhibiting the, the um, estrogen. So we're really at a disadvantage when we're using steroids, right? Anticonvulsants. So you'll talk more about anticonvulsants and peds, I believe, but these have a lot of bone um, 
destruction built into them. They inhibit vitamin D, they inhibit estrogen, they are inhibit thyroid a little bit, but also thyroid. Thyroid hormones, you'll talk about next rotation, message three, thyroid hormone is responsible for building, right? It's, it's a, it's a um, what's the word? It's a <laughs> technically anabolic, but it's technically a, a, something that's going to make you build tissue, build bone. So when you're hypothyroid, you don't grow as much some, some, compared to someone who's hyperthyroid in, in, in pediatrics, at least. All right, and then we got nutrition. So what's important for nutrition? Calcium, phosphorus, and what? Vitamin D, right? The only way calcium and phosphorus gets from your gut into your bloodstream is by you by vitamin D, right? And vitamin D has like three phases, right? It goes super saiyan once it hits the kidneys, right? Before that, it's just circling around. The liver produces it, and then it has to get activated in the skin, and then it has to then get activated finally in the kidneys. So people with chronic kidney disease have vitamin D deficiency and have low calciums or high calciums? They have low calciums, right? You can have just decreased calcium intake, right? Someone's not taking enough calcium in. You have no, someone's not taking enough vitamin D in. They're not getting out in the, on their, uh, in the sun and getting, you know, getting enough sun, UV rays, which activates vitamin D. Just kidding, because the amount of vitamin D you would get, uh, sorry, the amount of UV sun you would need to activate the amount of vitamin D you need to be healthy, you would get skin cancer first, right? <laughs> Compared to uh, just getting vitamin D naturally from the sun. So you can't just get it naturally from the sun. It's like, well, how do we survive for you know, 8,000, 10,000, whatever many years, right? Well, that's, you know, we, had, we had disease also, but either way, you have supplementation, right? You have to intake it. You have to intake vitamin D to, and also um, the activated form to get a adequate vitamin D level. So then we can then absorb further calcium and phosphorus, right? And decrease potassium intakes. So potassium is also necessary for keeping calcium inside your, inside your body. And then calories, right? So ex calories are made for ATP, for energy, for fat storage, and also for protein build, uh, building, right? So we don't have calories, we're not gonna make proteins, those proteins being collagen, right? And then what else? We got disease pathology. We got Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is just too many steroids that you are producing. So you have a tumor on your adrenal glands where steroids come from, right? So this is different from giving someone steroids, right? There's, that's Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease is where you have a problem with your adrenal glands, right? Producing too many steroids. So either one is, is, is a problem, right? You're going to get bone breakdown and all the other nice features of Cushing's, which are what? You got moon face, buffalo hump. These are attractive symptoms, right? And you got easy bruising, thin skin, because collagen is also in the skin. You got thin vessels and easy bruising, because your vessels are made of collagen also. So all these things are causing, uh, are a result of too many steroids, right? So vitamin D is not active because you don't have a kidney, right? You have chronic kidney disease, right? Your liver might not be producing vitamin D as well. And then parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin are the two hormones that regulate calcium, right? So which one lowers calcium? As when I say lowers, I mean in the bloodstream. So what, when you have too much of this hormone, it will make your calcium level low. Which one? Parathyroid, Parathyroid raises your calcium levels. It raises your calcium phosphate. It activates vitamin D. It is a hormone that you want around. And when you have patients with chronic kidney disease, they actually have hyperparathyroidism because they can't activate vitamin D and the body doesn't know any better. So, hey, make more vitamin D and you know, bring up the calcium level. And people with chronic kidney disease are high risk for osteomalacia and fractures because they are taking the calcium from their bones into the bloodstream, right? So a parathyroid hormone activates osteo who? No, osteoclasts, osteoclasts cleave bone, right? And when you cleave bone, what's, what is bone made of? Collagen, but also calcium and phosphorus. So the calcium and phosphorus level goes up when you have excess osteoclast activity, right? If you have increased osteoblast activity, that's gonna put the calcium and phosphorus from the bloodstream and lay it down, right? And when you lay it down, like what's the call when you, when you weld something, you have to put the stuff on it, what's it called? solder, right? You have to put the solder on it, right? That's where you lay down, you have to solder it in. That's actually alkaline phosphatase, ALP, alkaline phosphatase. So ALP is used by osteoblasts and your ALP level goes up and your calcium phosphate level goes down when you have increased osteoblast activity. And that's with what? Calcitonin, right? Calcitonin, CA, tonin, it tones down the calcium, right? It brings down your calcium levels, right? 
what else? We talked about inflammation. So inflammation is going to cause a activation of osteo, which osteoclast cleave bone, break it down further, and then it's going to cause a osteomalacia and a risk for fractures, a risk for other complications, right? And by via this little rank L. The reason why I bring it up is because we have different medications that inhibit rank L, right? And then Down syndrome, they don't have great aging, or I said they have accelerated aging, so that's, they're thinking that might be the association. And then lifestyle. So if you are bed bound, you are sedentary, right? Your body's on a use it or lose it system. If you don't use it, your body's not gonna make it anymore. That's why when you have get, take, give someone steroids, your adrenal glands say, oh, sure, you're, that's the other woman, I guess. Okay, all right, I'm not, I'm not making any more steroids anymore, we're out, right? And then you don't make any more steroids. So that's why you have to taper steroids, right? Because if you just stop someone's steroids, what's gonna happen? Their body's not making any steroids, right? So they're gonna they intake this IV steroids or PO steroids for X amount of time, and you cut, you cut it out, your body has stopped making it because you got it from somewhere else. The same thing with the bone tissue, right? So if you are not using the bone, then you're going to, it's gonna start breaking down over time, right? And how do you use bone? Hmm? You have to do impact activities, right? You have to do something that has impact that's going to use the bone over and over, right? You have to walk, you have to jog, you have to use things that are going to utilize the bone to make sure that it's going to strengthen itself, right? If you ever look at the like at the hand of an x-ray of a boxer versus a non-boxer, they have a lot more bone tissue compared to someone who doesn't, right? Because they're using it more. But like in a hospital setting or a skilled nursing facility who is someone's bed bound, they are going to be high risk of mus not only muscle breakdown, but bone breakdown, okay? So they got fractures. They already have a fracture in the past. They had a fracture because of osteoporosis in the first place. That will cause a, um, when they get the fracture, it causes imperfect wound healing. So your body's not great at healing itself. It can heal itself. And it's like you would not hire them again to, to, to fix your heart, to fix your bones, to fix your muscles. They usually have scar tissue, right? And it puts them at higher risk for a further bone fracture in the, in the future, right? Cigarette smoking is going to be inflammatory, causing rank L and causing osteo who to stimula be stimulated? Osteo clasts, right? Clasts cleave bone, right? So it also kills osteoblasts directly, which is not good, right? That's going to cause a demineralization of our bones, right? And then alcohol. Alcohol is inflammatory, and so we want to avoid more than three drinks per day, basically, okay? Does that make sense? These are things that you could prevent, you can teach, right? So you teach them don't drink or drink less than three glasses a day. You tell them to intake your vitamin D, intake your calcium. If you're not, I don't have a good diet in it, but we should know what a good diet is. They, what should I eat to you know, increase my calcium? What are you gonna say? You're gonna say milk? Milk has the lowest amount of calcium, right? It's like number nine on the list, right? Milk is actually fortified with vitamin D so they can advertise it to, to people to say that it's for strong bones. It's, it's, a, it's an ad campaign. It's not a, a like valid science, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the idea. So this is calling about you know, fractures will you have a really high mortality, the, even the older and older you get. All right, so this is kind of summarizing what we just talked about, right? So osteoclasts cleave bone, right? They actually resorb blood, or bone, sorry. They don't, you think the reabsorb and resorb, I'm not gonna test you on this, but it's something ridiculous that they throw out there. Resorb means to put it on, is to take it away. Reabsorb is to put it in, like into a sponge, and resorb is to take it out of the sponge, technically. Anyways, so min mineralization makes sense. We are going to, why don't they just say reabsorb at that point? All right, so mineralization means we're gonna put, take calcium and phosphorus from the blood, and we're gonna deposit it onto our, um, onto our bones, right? So blasts build bones. They deposit calcium and phosphorus onto what? onto collagen, right? And that's gonna decrease our serum calcium and phosphate, phosphate, right? Calcitonin does this, estrogen does this. Vitamin D will increase serum calcium and phosphorus for this whole process, right? You need calcium and phosphorus in the blood itself so that you can actually build bone, right? With osteo who? Osteoblasts, right? So here's our diet right here. And we have it, it's just gonna go right into the feces unless we have what? Vitamin D, or why don't you say 125 hydroxylase 
Uh, anyway, so cal calciferol. So that's, that, that is the actual, it has like five different names to it, right? You have calcitriol, calcidiol, 1-hydroxy, whatever, whatever, right? Either way, vitamin D is needed for that reabsorption from the GI tract, right? And that will then raise the calcium in your bloodstream so that you can then deposit it onto your, your bones over here, right? So your bones are, made, are being built by osteoblasts and they need calcitonin to help stimulate uh, bone depositing, to bone mineralization. And then vitamin D is necessary for this whole process. And who activates vitamin D? Our kidneys, right? So we have kidney failure, we have less vitamin D, less calcium absorption, brittle bones, or osteomalacia, which leads to osteo, which leads to fractures, right? So you have to have good intake of vitamin D or supplement vitamin D, especially as someone who is CKD, right? And there's PTH in there. PTH gets the process going too. If calcium is low in the bloodstream, it's going to ramp up vitamin D activity to help absorb calcium phosphorus, right? Calcitonin tones down the calcium. P PTH, a parathyroid hormone, raises calcium, right? It's going to raise vitamin D, but also it's you want your calcium levels great, right? What's, your, what's the normal calcium level? 8.5 to 10.5-ish, right? So you want that good, right? If it gets too low, you start getting ectopy and start getting, you know, start getting arrhythmias, torsades and such, right? So that's why parathyroid hormone and, and calcitonin are, are always in flux to make sure your calcium level is normal at all times, right? So osteopenia, that's just a, over time with aging, your bone mineral density goes down, right? So that's BMD, right? Bone mineral density will go down. That's with your, the spongy bone will fade first, whatever, and then you have a high risk of fractures, right? So if you fall, you're gonna be at high risk for a fracture. And then one third chance, right? One in three chance, you will die in a year if you fell, okay? So estrogen decrease over time we mentioned, right? Is, is integral to osteoblast activity. It inhibits rank L, right? Rank L is one of our inflammatory markers that will then activate osteo, who? Osteoclast, osteoclast cleave bone. We don't want that. So estrogen protects against that whole process, right? So I think I depicted it here, maybe estrogen. So estrogen is inhibiting rank L, right? What else? So osteomalacia, we mentioned that is just due to a disease process or a um, our own fault, something that might be modifiable, right? So we have some kind of pathology, a hormone problem, a disease problem, an environment problem. What's an environment problem that could be avoided? Benzene exposure? No, that's, that's gonna cause leuke leukemias. But for this, that's gonna be what? Smoking, alcohol, right? Would be something environmental that we can prevent, right? So increased parathyroid hormone, why is that happening? We might have CKD, right? Tumors, for when you talk about endocrine next semester, every, every answer for endocrine is it could be a tumor, right? That, that's what makes too much of that hormone. It could be a tumor, I don't know. All right, that's always the right answer. Okay, and then decreased vitamin D. That's also CKD causes low vitamin D and also in response, your body makes too much parathyroid hormone, all right? And that will cause your calcium levels, it's gonna to try to raise your calcium levels with parathyroid hormone, but, but and it's gonna start breaking down bone, but then you, you can't absorb, you can't replace it afterwards, right? Because you don't have the vitamin D to absorb from the GI tract, right? Vitamin D, it's still excreted fecally. Yeah, so uh, well, technically in CKD, you're, you're not going to get rid of calcium, right? And it's like, well, why does my calcium level go up then if, in CKD? Because you also don't get rid of phosphorus. And phosphorus and calcium are like Romeo and Juliet. They, whoa, whoa, what's up, right? And they, they then connect eyes and they then hook up, right? And they literally form calciphylaxis in joints and cause frost all throughout the body, right? And cause pruritus and such. Right, so then your calcium phosphorus levels, your calcium level goes down, your phosphorus, phosphorus level goes up, right? And that's what we give phosphorus binders in the GI tract, so that whatever calcium you do absorb, whatever little vitamin D you do have, or vitamin D in the supplement you give, will get absorbed without the phosphorus. So phosphate is deactivating calcium. It deactivates, it binds to and deactivates it, yeah. All right, so inflammation mentioned as well. Inflammation is going to activate osteoclasts, and that's going to cause bone breakdown. When would you have inflammation? You got smoking, alcohol, obesity. What's IBD? 
not irritable bowel disease, inflammatory, right? So inflammation from inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, right? IBS is just a, it doesn't really have any kind of pathology to it. It does, it's just an anterior nervous system hyper or hypoactivity, right? It's no, no like inflammation, there's no white blood cells, steroids is not the answer. It's always going to be just something that, you know, you're gonna have to work on, constipation or diarrhea. Whereas IBD is a problem, right? It has all kinds of meds attached to it. It's all kinds of inflammation. It causes extra intestinal symptoms. And we talk about extra intestinal symptoms, that means like outside the primary situation we're worried about. We talk about like rheumatoid arthritis today. RA is also gonna have extra articular symptoms. It's gonna have symptoms outside of the joints, right? It's gonna be widespread inflammation. Same thing with lupus. Lupus go, goes everywhere, right? Throughout the whole body. All right, and then ster oh, sorry, then back bone malignancies will cause localized inflammation, localized immune response, right? Leukemias, lymphomas, what's MM? Multiple myeloma, okay? And then steroids, we mentioned steroids already. They are going to break down not only the, uh, we're gonna, not only gonna break down the calcium phosphorus, right, and put it into the bloodstream, but it's also going to break down the actual collagen matrix of the whole bone itself, okay? So again, age over 30 is a big risk factor. We have chronic inflammatory disease, chronic kidney disease, GI diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. All these things are causing problems and eventually osteoporosis and symptoms of osteoporosis, right? So you imagine the symptoms of osteoporosis must be huge, must be ridiculous, right? Asymptomatic, right? No, no symptoms, right? No symptoms of it until you have a fracture. Sometimes you might have some, you know, some uh, uncommon symptoms, but most commonly it is asymptomatic, right? When it starts causing complications, like when you start having decreased height, right? Because your bones are getting weaker and weaker and weaker and you start getting your height. Notice the height here is lower, right? Sorry, you drop the height. That's a better picture down here. Good job. All right, so you got a better picture of, you, of the height reduction, right? Almost like two to three inches. Like, well, that's not asymptomatic. Well, yeah, but it's, they're not gonna complain about it, right? Until they start having like kyphosis, right? Kyphosis is the, you think of the, is that, does that work? Lordosis kyphosis with an F. Kyphosis is flexion of the spine. Oh, look at that, just a, a moment in time. That's why you should teach your material, right, to each other. So I tell, I tell everybody, I, I learn like 10, 12 things when I lecture, right? Anyways, kyphosis. So kyphosis is flexion of the spine, right? We are flexing the spine downward, and you get that with osteoporosis. And they call that not a buffalo hump, but a dowager's hump, right? Everybody's a dowager nowadays, right? That's where your rich grandma and your son has died and you're, and you're the owner of a castle. Yeah, the, who do you know who that's, who's that? Anyways, if you watch Downton Abbey, that is a dowager's hump, right? They, it's, this old lady has this kyphosis, right? Because she's lost height, her spine has literally gone from a normal spine and it's shrunken because of the loss of bone mass, right? So dowager's hump, loss of height, and then we have, uh, they get restrictive movement and they might even get some GERD symptoms or constipation because everything is, is kind of compressed at this point, right? With advanced disease, this is when you start getting some back pain and you can get some pain with activity, but usually, you know, 90% of the time it is asymptomatic, right? Until you have a fracture. Even then you're, you might've got, got the test done that shows what your uh, fracture risk is and you might have now have fallophobia or you have a history of falls and fractures and you are now scared to do things, right? And it's ironic because to improve osteoporosis, you have to do weight-bearing exercises, but they don't wanna do it because they will get a, they'll get a fracture. So it's, it's a catch-22, okay? So they have fallophobia, right? So their bone matrix is weakened, right? You might have all the collagen there, but it's not, you need the calcium phosphorus to be welded onto it to make it stable, okay? So diagnostic tests you can do are the dual energy x-ray absorbentry, I can't even say it, absorptiometry. So there's DEXA scan, right? So a DEXA scan is an x-ray, is a special x-ray they can do. They have to get, go and it looks like this in the bottom middle here, right? They go in there and they do a whole body scan, usually more of the, of the, uh, the hips more than anything else. And they're going to look for demineralization, right? They're gonna look for the amount of bone that's been broken apart, right? That has been weakened, right? And we can look at that to determine if there is a, um, a risk for osteoporosis and a risk for fractures, right? 
So what else can we do? So this is a DEXA scan. So DEXA scan gives you a score, right? And it's based on statistics, right? When you do statistics, you like graph the, the, the mean uh, bone mineral density for people their age. And if they are greater than, or less than negative 2.5 standard deviations, they are technically really, really high risk for, um, for fractures, right? They have a really high fracture risk. At this point, they need medications to fix their osteoporosis. Right, so it's less than negative 2.5. So we have like a number line here, right? Less, this is zero, this is one, this is one. Less than would be more negative, right? It's not greater than negative 2.5 because that would mean more positive, that's great, right? We want to have a really bad bone mineral density. I don't like this way this was, was phrased, so I turned it on its side, it makes more sense. If you go downwards, right, that is more osteoporosis, that is a more negative score. A more negative score means you have a high risk for what? For fractures, right? And, fra and why is that a big deal? Because one third don't, don't, don't live if they get a fracture after one year. Okay, you can get a fancy CT scan, but nobody can afford that. Insurance won't cover it. And then we have secondary causes of osteomalacia. So we got to see all the other things. Is there some reason why you have osteoporosis, but you know it's not because of age. It's not because of your small frame, right? So we just look at all those things. Are you taking steroids? Are, what's your vitamin D level, right? If your vitamin D level is low, that could be a reason for a osteoporosis-like symptoms or poor bone mineral density. Less than what? What's, what's a T-score? That's your DEXA scan, a T-score less than negative 2.5, right? So what else? So alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase we mentioned was what osteo who use? what osteoblasts use to lay down calcium and phosphorus. And as they are welding, the little welding sparks you could think of are the alkaline phosphatase. They have to chew through the bone and deposit the calcium and phosphorus. They literally spit up these enzymes, right? It's like bees, right? Bees will spit up their, their vomit onto their, um, onto their beehive matrix, right? And then someone came by and was like, ooh, that's sweet. Let me let me get that, all right? And that's what honey is, right? It's bee vomit, all right? It's been enzymatically degraded bee vomit. Anyways, so we have a um, we have that's alkaline phosphatase. You just you just vomit up the osteoblasts vomit it up, and they will then and then you you can measure that, and that will be increased with a um, with there's a problem with increased osteoblast activity. Right? Maybe it's a calcium phosphorus imbalance, right? The calcium is too high or too low. If it's too low, that means there is probably maybe chronic kidney disease. It'd probably be the first, first consideration. If it's too high, they might be, have something that's chewing at the bone, like a multiple myeloma, or like remember multiple myeloma has crab, right? It has hypercalcemia, right? Because you're breaking down all of that bone. What else we have? So renal dysfunction, we look at the creatinine level, protein, we look for multiple myeloma, and then inflammation. Is there any kind of inflammation happening, right, in the body? And we can measure that. It's an old test, but it checks out, right? It's a test where you can measure the, the, the rate at which erythrocytes or RBCs settle, right? If you take little RBCs and pour into a little tube, a little, little manometer, like a mercury thermometer, and you say, well, how long does it take to get from point A to point B in one hour? Well, if it goes by 10 millimeters, that's technically a, a high erythrocyte, uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or an ESR. Sedimentation is like where things sediment, where things fall, where things uh, gravitate downward. So we can measure that. So if it's increased, right, if it, takes, it goes by, down really fast, that means there's stuff inside the blood, like antibodies or antigens for that matter, or inflammation, inflammatory markers, cytokines, interleukins, all those fancy things, okay? So these are all the diagnostic tests that to look to see what else could be causing our bone to become very, very thin. So a higher ESR means you're more likely to... That means you have some kind of inflammation happening, right? Yes? Um, is it also a drug, is it proton pump inhibitors? Yeah, so proton pump inhibitors, they actually release a chemical, right? One of their metabolites actually goes and stimulates rank L. So therefore you get hypocalcemic, right? Or you get you get bone breakdown, actually. You wouldn't get hypocalcemic right away, okay? All right, so non-pharmacological treatment. Weight loss, all right, is a great thing to have so that we have less uh, physical forces on our bones that are already weakened, right? So weight loss as recommended 
all right? So more weight means more fracture risk as well, all right? Someone falls with 200 pounds versus 300 pounds, 300 pounds person is gonna have a much higher risk of fracturing their hip, okay? And then increased osteoblast activity, so blast build bone when there's bone stress, right? So grandma right here, she has a lot, a lot of stress that she's putting on that those arms. So those arms are gonna be beefcakes soon enough. Okay, so muscle strength exercises, the muscles will pull at the bone, right? As the muscle pulls at the bone, it's going to the osteoblasts are gonna build more bone around that tendon, right? Increase weight bearing exercises. What's a weight bearing exercise again? It's jogging, that's running, that's ballet, that's whatever that is putting stress, right? Boxing, right? I'm gonna recommend your nine year old grandma, you should get to boxing, right? So that these things that are going to put stress on joints, put stress on legs, on, on bones basically, right? And balance is important because your balance degrades over time and we want the balance to be great. So if they do fall, they can catch themselves, right? So if they, you do, I guess you could recommend yoga, but you're doing things that like, like ballet where they have to balance and they can then catch themselves before they fall. All right, supplements, calcium is gonna do, and vitamin D. It makes sense, if, they need, if, they're cal if we need calcium and vitamin D to make bones, we might as well give them as much as possible, right? So calcium diet is actually better than supplements, and vice versa for vitamin D. Supplements are better than diet, all right? So but calcium supplements, we'll make sure they get the, the right amount in. So milk is the wrong answer. Milk didn't even make the top 10, right? You could consider yogurt dairy, but it's not even the top 10 as far as high calcium foods, right? So firm tofu. Actually, sorry, skim milk is right there. I lied, all right? So skim milk, but as far as like vitamin D, I think I'm, I'm thinking of. But anyways, we have calcium sources, firm tofu, yogurt, some cheeses, spinach, all these things will increase your, um, your calcium con consumption, right? Or calcium levels. And then we got uh, vitamin D, right? So vitamin D, you could say, oh, I'm only going to go and get my vitamin D from the sun, but that has, a, you're going to skin cancer first, right? So well, I'm going to put sunscreen. Well, you don't have enough time. You have to be out, out for like three hours or something for that to work, okay? And vitamin D absorbs calcium and phosphorus from the intestines. That's the only way you can get calcium and phosphorus into your bloodstream, all right? There's nothing else out there that doesn't, right? What else? So we have uh, smoking alcohol. That makes sense because that's going to break down more bones, so we should avoid it and we should get annual height measurements to see if they are shrinking, right? You see grandma is shrinking, it's like, I knew it, right? So this is a stadiometer, it's, that's the, the height measuring device at the, at the doctor's office, all right? You just point to that thing, stand on that thing, all right? It's called a stadiometer, technically, okay? And then BMD measurements, we had, how do we measure BMD? You get a DEXA scan, the X-ray absorptiometry, I said it. Anyways, we're gonna do a DEXA scan, right? So that's going to be measure their T-score. And the T-score should be less than what? I even put a little math question here. It's gonna be less than negative 2.5, right? So you, a negative score is bad, right? More and more negative is bad. When your bank account is negative 2.5, that's bad. If it's negative three, is that better? No, so it's less than negative 2.5, right? So those who are you know, over 65 especially should be getting this done. And there's something little that uses the DEXA score. It puts you, you punch the DEXA score in there, right? And you punch in all these other things, age, gender, weight, height, and other things that are wrong with you. Do you smoke? Do you drink alcohol? Do you have this disorder, that disorder? And that's your actual, your FRAX score, or your, your risk of fracture, right? So FRAX score is an important thing to look to see if someone needs therapy, needs medications, right? To improve their, um, their bone health. So these are the different vitamin Ds here. You have calciferol, you have calcidiol, you have 125 hydroxylate uh, vitamin D. So these are all the different calciums, but essentially it ultimately gets to the gut and the gut is what's going to uh, then allow uh, calcium phosphorus absorption, okay? What else on here? So we've got benefits of doing impact, uh, low impact Exercise, you know, for grandma, you can probably try low impact at first, but then you'd be doing weight bearing, right? Does that mean you're recommending swimming? No, no. no. swimming does not bear weight, right? Not unless you're doing like deep diving, maybe, and you can argue gravity, and you can put in the, so the negative 9.8, is it, you know, anyways, it's going to, no, it's going to be, has to be putting weight on the bones, okay? All right, so medications. All right, so these are all your medications for osteoporosis, okay? So bisphosphonates are usually the bread and butter for 
osteoporosis, any kind, anything bone related. Bisphosphonates are going to promote bone health. And how do they do that? They break, they, they force osteoclasts to commit suicide, right? Because osteoclasts commit suicide when they are not perfect. If they are not perfect, they, they go through apoptosis, right? So how do they do that? Well, they hide inside of the ATP, inside, it's like a, another Trojan horse. They hide, so here's like, I'm making ATP, and here is your bisphosphonate right there, right? And it's gonna hide inside the uh, ATP production line, and then when, the, when it's ready to go, it just degrade. it says, well, this is not, I'm not functional now, so it's gonna osteo, it's gonna apoptose, right? So bisphosphonates are nice that they all end in dronate, right? So bisphosphonates end in dronate. So you have alendronate, abandronate, resendronate, lisalendronate, pamidronate. So all of these have the last the last name if they are, they are a bisphosphonate, right? These are your first line osteoporosis drugs. So uh, the PO forms are usually the more common one, but you can get an IV shot every 12 to 18 months or an IV infusion of it. And um, the issue with these is they can cause breakdown of the esophagus causing esophagitis. So we recommend that they, when they take a PO, right, they're taking their daily um, alendronate, for instance, they, they need to make sure they're sitting upright. Otherwise, it's, it's a, what does eight mean? Like phos, like a, not phosphate, but uh, citrate or, I don't know, what else is a good example? Lactate, right? That's just lactic acid. It's just, a, it's a fancy word for acid, right? So zoledronic acid is zolendronate. So if you have an acid on your esophagus, you better drink some water and stay upright. So that acid goes into your stomach and then it gets digested, right? It mixes the right, right air. If they're laying flat, that acid will make its way down the esophagus and burn and scar and cause GERD. So you want to avoid that as a side effect, okay? So another, um, it's promoting osteoblast activity, right? Because you have less osteoclast activity. If the osteoblasts are working more, they're building more bone. If you're building more bone, what's your calcium phosphorus levels gonna do? They're gonna go down, right? And then what else? So osteonecrosis of the jaw, that doesn't sound fun, right? So your jaw can get dead. So there's an osteonecrosis of the jaw because of a use of bisphosphonates is a unique thing. You can't really, uh, what's the word? You can't really theorize like how, how it happens. It is just associated with these ones. Same thing like AFib was the lendronate specifically. That's, we don't, it just, it's just something that's reported very commonly, okay? So the other thing about the bisphosphonates, if they're IV, if we have a hypercalcemic crisis, we have too much calcium being produced in the bloodstream or calcium level like greater than 12.5, greater than 11.5, right? That is a, you can fix that with uh, sorry, IV bisphosphonates, right? Zolendronate being one of them, right? So it's, an, it's another way you can use it. Otherwise, you, know, you use the IV forms every 12 to 18 months. All right, so we have MABs. MABs stand for monoclonal antibodies, all right? We'll talk about a lot more MABs when we talk about uh, lupus and RA. They, use, they are specifically designed antibodies. They're monoclonal antibodies that then go specifically to a specific site and inhibit it, right? So what are they inhibiting here? They're inhibiting rank L. So if you inhibit rank L, you don't get osteoclast activity, right? That, that should make sense. So if, if we don't want osteoclasts and osteoclasts are stimulated by rank L, let's give a medication that's gonna specifically bind to those, right? So here's a denosumab. It binds to rank L and therefore we don't get the activity that rank L would normally do, which is osteo who activity? Osteoclast activity, right? We don't wanna be, we wanna stop cleaving bones. We don't want osteoclasts, right? So denosumab and uh, remusumab, these are the two uh, medications that will uh, promote bone health. Denosumab does it by binding to rank L. Remusumab does it by another mechanism we're not gonna really focus on too much, but it's gonna essentially when a bone is made, it releases a, a uh, chemical saying, I'm done. And so you wanna stop that. You wanna, you wanna keep building bone. You don't want the I'm done signal, right? So these little, they're called serosotins. Anyways, I got dual acting bone agents. You don't see these that much, but these are another thing that can be in your pocket or literally a, in your sachet because it's given as little, uh, you know, like, like little pebble, like little beads. If you open up a, a capsule, right? Which you're not supposed to do, right? When you're giving peg meds. Anyways, you have a little sachet that you pour into the um, into the drink and they drink it. 
And then we have, those are not, these are all considered non-hormonal agents. These are things that are not gonna affect your hormones like calcitonin or parathyroid or even estrogen for that matter. But we can give, give estrogens and other things that will be hormonally fixing them, right? So calcitonin does what? It tones down the calcium, right? It's going to increase osteoblast activity and that will tone down your calcium. So obviously the side effect is low calcium, but it's promoted that that calcium went to a good cause. It went to the bone and got deposited, right? And then we have estrogens and estrogens inhibit rank L, right? So that's great. And now that will inhibit osteoclast activity and therefore we have more bone being built, right? But you can't put everyone estrogen. It's like, oh, why don't we everybody get it then? Well, estrogen itself is thrombogenic. It forms what? Thrombi, VTE, right? Hot flashes we can live with, right? We can just go outside. It's cold out right now. But with clots, you can't just go outside. It's not going to fix it, right? You have to, you have to then be on something anticoagulant of some sort, right? So it's like, why doesn't everybody over age 45 that just get estrogen shots? Because there's a high risk of clots. Okay, and then parathyroid hormone. This is a, a weird one because parathyroid has two actions technically. Its action we usually think of is when parathyroid is in a, in a high amount and its parathyroid hormone will do what? It's gonna break down bone. But when parathyroid is in a low amount, it actually stimulates bone. So that's just a unique thing about parathyroid hormone. It's in a low dose to stimulate bone, bone production. Okay, so just following these, these uh, different graphs here, or these different uh, mechanisms, right? So we got these guys, these MABs are inhibiting the um, osteoclasts in some fashion, right? The parathyroid hormone at the bottom there, those uh, abaloparatide and teriparatide, these guys are stimulating the bone actually, right? Stimulating, stimulating the bone uh, to, to deposit more than inhibit, okay, the osteoclasts. And then what else we have? We talked about those guys and parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. What do they usually do? Calcitonin is going to inhibit our osteoclasts, which is great, and that will pr promote osteoblast activity. All right, and bisphosphonates, and technically also our, um, our denosumab will cause osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is a not a great side effect, okay? So those are your bone meds for osteoporosis.